So, a few months ago, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was released to absolutely huge critical acclaim. The Legend of Zelda franchise is as hot as ever before, and one of the regular talking points online has been the ridiculously contrived Legend of Zelda timeline. Basically, a few years back, fans started to insanely try and piece together all of the different Zelda games into one big cohesive story. Personally, I always found this notion ridiculous, as the majority of Zelda games follow loosely the same narrative. So I was always under the assumption that Nintendo were telling the same piece of mythology over and over, but slightly different. Lots of common tropes were there, Hyrule, the Trifle, Zelda, Link, Ganon, etc. It was all bloody there. So most Zelda games, except for the direct sequels, just constantly felt like a reboot of the franchise. However, ultimately, I appear to be wrong, as during an act of fan service, Nintendo decided to release their own official Zelda timeline. Personally, I still think the concept of this timeline is nonsense, and Nintendo were just running with what the fans wanted, but nonetheless, I am digressing. Today's video is about the games Nintendo want you to forget about. How have I come to this conclusion, you may ask? Because there are simply many games missing from this official timeline that are not included in Nintendo's retrospective chart. We are going to be looking at the many games that were made prior to the publication of the timeline that are on the whole completely ignored by Nintendo. So let's take a look at the events that unfolded in Hyrule that Nintendo wants you to forget about. I am going to start off this video by talking about the most talked about missing games from this timeline and those are of course the Zelda games published on the Philips CDI. These games have become infamous since James Roth, the angry video game nerd, featured them on his channel. In fact, these games are so well known and so regularly discussed in most Zelda conversations that I would say it's almost insulting to the Zelda fanbase itself that these games are ignored. These games are now an important part of gaming history and are a remnant of the deal Nintendo cancelled with Sony to make the Nintendo PlayStation. Ok, so we know these games were obviously not created by Nintendo, but nonetheless Nintendo still gave Philips permission to use the Zelda name, so therefore that doesn't take away from the fact that this actually happened, and all three of these Zelda games are officially licensed products. These games are just as much Zelda games as Link to the Past or Ocarina of Time, and just because they are reportedly poor quality products, that doesn't mean these things aren't still the real deal. The reason why I say these games are reportedly bad is because I am only basing this information on other people's opinions. I have always fancied giving these three games a go, but I have no desire to pay out more than a couple of pounds for reportedly bad quality stuff. But by going off sales I've seen, it suggests more people want to own these games just to say they have them, rather than going to good homes of actual Philips CDI platform owners like myself. If I ever stumble across these games, I'd certainly give them a fair chance. So I talk about some of the gameplay of these three games in this video, but since I have never played the games myself, I won't waste your time, especially since these games have already been talked about to death on YouTube. I'm pretty sure most of you would have heard it all before anyway, however if you do want to know even more about them, there are plenty of derpy American channels out there for you to watch on the subject. However, this is of course if you can put up with seeing some generic looking millennial behaving creepily over enthusiastic in order to get that pre-teen demographic while simultaneously screaming about how bad these games are in an act of ultimate hyperbole. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the CDI games, a non-Nintendo platform the Japanese suits like to pretend never existed. Now, let's talk about a Nintendo gaming device they created themselves, which they also seem to like pushing under the rug today. The Nintendo Sateleview. Sateleview games were broadcast episodically in weekly or sometimes daily installments, usually with a total of four parts. As new episodes were added, players would either be confronted with new levels and maps, or their original game worlds would become further unlocked, allowing exploration of new areas in the game. One of the Zelda Satellifew games was BS Zelda no Densetsu, which was the fifth game developed by Nintendo belonging to the Legend of Zelda series. One thing notable about this game is that it does not feature Link, but instead features the same main character that the player selects from the Satellifew BSX. So I suppose to Nintendo's credit, the game would look a bit odd in the Zelda timeline anyway. 
By fans, the game is generally considered to be a spin-off title from the main Zelda series, and is stylistically similar to the original top-down Legend of Zelda game for the NES, but utilises the same 16-bit graphical capabilities of the Super Nintendo. The game is also referred to by some as an enhanced remake of the original game. This conception most likely arises from the superficial stylistic similarities of the game and the fact that the game is no longer playable in its original form. Thus the differing plot of the game is more or less unknown to the general gaming public. The game was broadcast a total of five times and several broadcasts were associated with special nationwide contests and prizes. The game's popularity amongst the Teleview players prompted the development of a second quest for the game, which featured remixed maps for the game. The game may often get forgotten today, however using the power of emulation, the world can now experience this often overlooked gem. Since this video is about games that Nintendo want you to forget about, rather than video games specifically, I thought today would also be as good a time as any to talk about the Legend of Zelda board games. The one that may spring to mind at present is of course the Legend of Zelda Monopoly game, which I must say looks rather spiffing. However, prior to the release of that game, there were a couple of others as well. Milton Bradley published a Legend of Zelda board game back in 1988, which was a simple roll and move game based on the franchise. The game sounds very boring and you'd have to be a basement dwelling lunatic with no life to want to play it in the first place. So let me save you the trouble by explaining how the game works myself. You make your way through six worlds by rolling a dice. You turn over tiles and either collect hearts or fight monsters. Literally all this game consists of is rolling the dice. And to make this even more exciting, you simply win by having the most hearts. There was also another Zelda board game published by Bandai in 1986, which was Japan only. This game is less simplified than its American counterpart and appears to replicate the video game a lot closer than the Milton Bradley board game. It comes with an overworld map, dungeon tiles and four link pawns in different colours. Throughout the game, items, health, money and triforce pieces are collected. Dice are in the game for attack and defence and a hefty rulebook is also included. Whilst on the subject of board games and Milton Bradley, I made a nice video about them last week, which I think you should all watch. It is about the MB Microvision, the world's first cartridge-based handheld gaming device. The technology is the thing that got stolen by Nintendo and used to create the Game & Watches, which brings me on to the next game which has failed to make the timeline, The Legend of Zelda for the Game & Watch. If we are to simply look at the timeline, you would be quick to assume that Link's Awakening on the Game Boy was Link's first handheld expedition. However, as usual, this is Nintendo lies, as there are earlier games missing from this timeline. The Game & Watch 1989 game sees Link make his debut on the handheld screen. This is one of those simple, ugly LCD games. Link's movement is limited, however he can move from right to left. And by pressing up, Link can go upstairs. Link can also use any equipped weapon by pressing the attack button and Link can perform a sword beam attack when his life meter is full of 5 hearts. The core formula is based on that of the original Legend of Zelda game where Link must fight through 8 dungeons and obtain the 8 shards of the Triforce of Wisdom. However it bears more gameplay similarities to the adventure of Link since it is 2D and from a side on perspective. As expected, this game is nothing special so it is not worth owning at all really Today, Game & Watch devices are ludicrously expensive, despite being very boring and very primitive on the whole. It's just the usual case of anything with Nintendo brand on it going for fortunes today. You can find LCD games made by other companies of the same quality for pennies, so don't bother with this overpriced Nintendo tat. Besides, you can emulate it like I have done in this video anyway. Yeah! Whilst on the subject of low quality LCD games, there was also Legend of Zelda Game Watch, not to be confused with Game and Watch. This was a multi-purpose wristwatch produced by Nelsonic. It is considered not up to par with the Zelda Game & Watch game because the screen was too small to reasonably allow much strategy or movement. The playing area was even smaller than that of the Game Boy titles in the series. So due to all of this, Nintendo swept this Nelsonic game under the carpet. Believe it or not, there is actually a Zelda game on the Nintendo Wii which rarely ever gets talked about or acknowledged. So obviously you have Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword on the system, but there is actually another as well. 
The Wii has a little game called Link's Crossbow Training, which hardly ever gets mentioned by anyone. If you're watching at home, I'd gather you've probably heard of it, but most likely forgotten about it, as for some reason it feels like it never even happened. The game came bundled with the Wii Zapper and is set in the world in the style of Twilight Princess. In the game, the player assumes control of Link and the goal is to perfect your crossbow marksmanship. In this simple game, the player must shoot stationary bullseye targets before moving on to moving targets and actual enemies. The game is actually half decent, however it is very, very short. I guess the reason the game isn't in the timeline is because there is not much of a story to it. One game that is on the timeline though, is Majora's Mask. You know that game that most people despised on release, which is now considered a god tier game. Maybe some games really are like fine wines and do get better with age. Anyway, one of the many odd features of Majora's Mask was the introduction of a character known as Tingle, who is essentially the Jar Jar Binks of the Zelda universe. This rather unlikable character for some reason has an entire set of games focused around him, most of which are Japan only. I suppose this is one of the main differences between the West and Japan. Many things we look at as just weird and stupid, they look at as hilarious. Tingle is one of those things because I guess, well, Japan! Tingle to me has always looked like he should probably be on the Sex Offenders register rather than in a Nintendo game. The first of these games was released in 2006 on the DS in Japan and Europe and was named freshly picked Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land. The story begins when Tingle, a middle-aged man, is offered a life in Rupee Land, a rupee paradise by a mysterious character known as Uncle Rupee. Uncle Rupee guides Tingle who goes on many quests and ventures into several dungeons to gather rupees. Tingle is told that when he gathers enough rupees and throws them into a magical spring, a towel will shoot forth and take him to Rupee Land. I kind of look at Tingle as the weird, greedy, perverted corporate manifestation of the Zelda series, much in the same way I look at Wario within the Mario universe. Characters like Wario and Tingle are the true faces of Nintendo. Greed personified. In 2007, Club Nintendo members in Japan saw the release of Tingle's Balloon Fight DS. It is very similar to the original Balloon Fight game on the NES, but it has several differences as well. It stars Tingle as the main character, obviously, and has music from Tingle's Rosy Ruby Land. 2009 saw the DSiWare release of the Too Much Tingle Pack. It included several applications like a calculator, a little dancing tingle image, a fortune teller, a timer and a coin flipping mini game. The app was only available in Japan because as I said, the rest of us aren't strange enough to find tingle appealing. Finally, 2009 also saw Ripen Tingle's Balloon Trip of Love, which was also a Japan exclusive on the DS. The game is a parody of The Wizard of Oz, where Tingle meets three friends, a scarecrow, a tin woman and a lion. Together they follow the yellow brick road and advance from page to page. Unlike the previous installments of this series, this is a point and click game. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is a spin-off Legend of Zelda game which is a point and click adventure game that parodies The Wizard of Oz. Hmm, I wonder why Nintendo wouldn't have put this in their timeline. One more thing of note regarding these odd Tingle games is that they are developed by Vanpool using Nintendo's permission rather than by Nintendo themselves, which is perhaps why they are less conservative than most Nintendo games. Before I wrap up this video, we need to pop back and look at the Satellaview again as I believe there is a game on it which is criminally, criminally swept under the carpet by Nintendo, and I do not even understand why really, as everyone should know about this game. Remember a few years ago on the 3DS when we received that fantastic Link Between Worlds game? Well, the main thing I found really odd about it was that it was marketed as a sequel to Link to the Past, set in the same version of Hyrule. Why is this odd, you may ask? because Nintendo had already made a direct sequel to Link to the Past, set in the same version of Hyrule. But I guess according to the official Zelda timeline, that never ever happened. That's how you avoid chronological confusion, ladies and gentlemen. Erase games from your history. Anyway, as I was saying, the original direct sequel to Link to the Past could be found on the Satellaview. The game was known as BS The Legend of Zelda The Ancient Stone Tablets. The game has a very similar overworld to Link to the Past, but has slight changes and entirely new dungeons. The game also features an entire new story, 
Another change to gameplay is that various actions also earn the player points, and these points could later be traded into Nintendo for different prizes. Ancient stone tablets like the other Satellaview Zelda game once again features the Satellaview sprite rather than Link. This new tale is set after the events of Link to the Past. The male character you play as wears a green tunic and a backwards baseball cap. How rad! The game was divided into four weeks with one hour long broadcast per week in the style of a serialised drama or cartoon. Aside from the opening and ending cutscenes, this gave players 50 minutes in which to beat two dungeons, hunt in the secrets and perform all of the other standard Zelda actions. Once the time was up, whether the player has completed all the tasks available to them or not, the game would end and his or her progress would be saved. The game made use of streaming orchestrated music, which consisted of tracks from The Legend of Zelda sound and drama, as well as technology called Live Voice, which applied tips to players at key points during the game and progressed the plot in the form of a fully voice acted drama. Aside from the narrator who spoke to the player directly, characters such as Arganim and Princess Zelda would speak to the hero via telepathy and convey information and plot developments. After the Satellaview broadcasts, the game was never playable again even for those who still possess the game on an 8 meg memory pack. This was of course until the advent of an amazing thing called emulation. However, if you emulate the game, the voice acting and streaming orchestral music is impossible to replicate, so the game contains written text instead. So, there you have it ladies and gentlemen. I sincerely hope I brought at least one game to your attention you have never heard of. Let me know if some of these games existences came as a surprise to you, since Nintendo liked to gloss over certain aspects of their history. That was some Zelda games Nintendo probably want you to forget about. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. I am on a constant quest to produce intriguing content, so feel free to contact me however you like and give me some more ideas. Thank you for watching today's video. It's always fun to talk about overlooked elements of gaming history. Shout outs to Shizuka Kabayashi, Mad Ape Productions, Andrew Bazansky, Peter Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly and all of my other patrons. Thank you for all of your support. Yeah. If you want to be added to this prestigious list of patrons, then check out my Patreon page. Ta-ta and farewell.